Hey everyone, and welcome to a very different video. Today I won't be playing a game, but I will still be talking about one, just not a video game. Today I'm going to be talking about Survivor. Survivor is my favorite TV show of all time. By my estimation, I've spent more time watching Survivor than playing any video game series except for Pokemon. And not just by a little, but by maybe hundreds if not thousands of hours. Since I started watching the show in 2012, I've watched every season multiple times, I've gotten invested in international Survivor franchises, I've become one of the most hated users on the Survivor subreddit, and I have overanalyzed the past three seasons, getting the winner right twice. So with the first new season in a year and a half airing, I'm bringing Survivor into my YouTube channel, and I'll be talking about my predictions for Survivor 41. Now, because of the ongoing pandemic, Survivor was unable to film last year and barely was able to film this year in its usual location of Fiji, where it's filmed since 2016. The last season of the show finished airing in May, meaning it's been nearly a year and a half since Survivor has been on the air. This is the longest off-season in the show's history, even if you include the widely popular South African and Australian franchises, which aired seasons this summer. But now, after such a long wait, Jeff Probst is going to be back on our screens with some adjustments. CBS is forcing a quota requiring at least half of each cast to be made up of minorities. Jeff is going to talk directly to the audience, telling us directly about new advantages and different scenarios in the game. And this season is only going to last two-thirds of the length of past seasons, 26 days instead of 39. This last change is going to have a major impact on the game. Those familiar with Australian Survivor know that each season lasts around 50 days compared to the 39 days of the first 40 seasons of US Survivor. Five of those six seasons, all of those casts made up of new players have one thing in common. Each winner played a very quiet game, each typically shielded by stronger, more threatening players. These players are what we would call meat shields, those who are most threatening strategically or physically. Very few U.S. players have implemented the meat shield strategy in a winning game, most notably Jeremy Collins in Survivor Second Chance. But in a longer game, the players who organize big blindsides or win numerous challenges become even more threatening, and the players have more opportunities to vote them out. So looking at it from that perspective, the opposite must be true. In a shorter game, there will be fewer opportunities to vote out the big threats. So, in this new, shorter season, we'll likely see the big players make massive moves with very few consequences against them. A shorter game will incentivize making big moves, something Jeff Probst and the production team have been seemingly wanting more of, injecting the show with more hidden immunity idols and advantages the past 10 seasons, with no real sign of sh slowing down. Now, moving on from the changes being made to the format of the show, I'd like to talk about the cast. I really like this group of players, and there's only really one person I dislike. So, I'm going to focus on my favorites today. Since this season is going to have three tribes of six players, I'm going to talk about my top six players going into the season. First up is Sydney Seagal, who seems like she's going to be one of the villains based on her preseason content. She says it herself, she's smart, athletic, and egotistical. And also my parents just nurse this ego from the moment I was born. Like It seems like she's going to be a mean girl type of player, but not like Corinne from Survivor Gabon. Sugar, you are an unemployed, uneducated leech on society. And the only thing I would vote to give you is a handful of antidepressants so that no one else has to be subjected to your constant crying anymore. And maybe if you got some, then it would seem a little more sincere when you are crying about your dead father. Instead, more like Courtney Yates, another fan favorite villain from Survivor China and Heroes vs. Villains. I think it's extremely likely that she's going to flame out at some point in the game and is probably going to go home in a unanimous vote. Next up is Xander, who at first glance just seems like the typical challenge bro of the season. Someone like Ozzy or Joe, who's there to be a provider, win challenges, and not much else. Instead, he gives me vibes similar to Devin or Malcolm, someone you may think is just another golden boy, but who in reality is helping to pull all the strings strategically. And I think this is going to be a really good thing for him, because in this season, as I mentioned, I think the big threats are all going to come for each other, he doesn't seem like the biggest mastermind. He doesn't even seem like the biggest challenge threat. So I think he'll make it deep before his target gets too big. But I definitely don't see a win coming from him. And next up, we have Jairus Robinson, or as he calls himself, JD. At first, I thought he'd be a bit of a train wreck, but he seems really self-aware and intelligent. He has stated that he wants to be the first winner younger than Survivor itself. And I think he's going to be a great character. 
But while I don't see him winning this time, I think he will be a favorite who can come back in a couple of years and pull off an astounding win. Also, as a bit of a side note, he mentions Fabio as being one of the best winners. And, I mean, I wouldn't call Fabio one of the best winners, but he's certainly one of my favorites. So that's a plus from him. Now moving on to my top three is Sarah Wilson, who fills an archetype I'm not typically a fan of. She seems to me like the Kara K of the season. The young girl who focuses mostly on the social part of the game and who the super fans see as a major threat to win, but in reality isn't really a threat at all. The only player in this archetype who has won is Michelle, who played the same game twice, averaging out to second place. Maybe it's the fact that I actually liked watching Michelle play last season, but for the first time, I'm actually really rooting for the social player. That said, I still expect her to fill the role of her archetype, making it deep, just not ending up with the win. The shorter season is going to prioritize playing big, and that doesn't seem like Sarah. She just seems like she doesn't want to make waves. Based on the preseason content, my second favorite player so far is Eric Abraham. And while the demographics between me and him don't really line up at all, he's an older black guy from the South. I'm a young white guy from the North. I feel like I can relate to him more than most people on this cast. He's a cybersecurity analyst, and I'm studying cyber, so I want to see a guy from my field do well. He seems like a really nice guy, and I think it would be pretty easy for him to integrate into any tribe. Plus, as former military and a cybersecurity expert, I think that he's going to do really well, both physically and strategically. So I have a lot of high hopes for him. Ruby, my mama, did not send her baby boy out here to be psychic. Finally, my favorite player based on the preseason content and my winner pick for the season is Brad Reese. From the moment the cast was leaked back in May, I had him pegged as the winner, and I've been pretty accurate recently, narrowing the Season 39 winner down to Tommy and Chelsea, ultimately picking Tommy as my Fantasy League winner, and using a random number generator to pick Tony as the winner of Winners at War. I've been talking this whole time about how this season is going to be incentivizing big moves, and we'll probably see a big player win. Well, Brad isn't the smartest player, he isn't the strongest, but what he has is the ability to connect with just about anyone. You have to be very adaptable. You have to kind of be able to do everything on a ranch, right? So you're an economist. I can talk supply demand curves with you. You, you got to be a plumber, an electrician, besides being able to work cows. And so if he gets to the end with a big player, he probably isn't going to have any blood on his hands. And if he turns on his threatening allies before the end of the game, he'll probably have the best resume at the end. Regardless, whoever is sitting next to him at the end is going to be thinking to themselves, oh crap, he hasn't made enemies all season long. And that just might be the biggest move of them all. And you know what? I've called my shot on the winner of the season, but I want to make predictions today on who I think is going to be the first person voted out from each tribe and who's going to make the final six of this season. From the Yellow Yase tribe, I think they're going to Tribal Council first. They seem pretty strong, but it seems like they have a lot of forces that are going to be at odds with each other. So I think that going to Tribal Council first, they're going to need to get rid of some of that negativity. They're going to need to really come together to make a cohesive group in order to move forward as a tribe. And on that tribe of six, I think the first person who's going home is going to be Evie Jagoda. She really screams first boot material to me. In her cast bio, she described her number one pet peeve as manly men. And she loves the seasons of Survivor where the women come together to vote off all the men. Well, one point against her, One World is the only bad season of Survivor. And another point against her, the men on her tribe are Eric, who's former military, dude bro Xander, and the arrogant doctor, David Voce. I doubt that the other two girls on the tribe would agree to vote out any of these strong guys first, which is gonna end up putting Evie in a pretty tough spot. After Yellow goes to Tribal Council, I think they're going to be safe for a while. I think it's going to be the Green Ua tribe that's attending the most Tribal Councils pre-merge, and that really sucks because I think this is the best group by far. But here, I think that the biggest target's going to be Jeannie, who's the older woman of the tribe. The older ladies tend to get voted off early, and if she doesn't pull her weight in challenges, she'll be an easy target, which is too bad because she seems like a really fun character. Finally, the Blue Luvu tribe. I love her, but I think Sydney is going to go home early. Blue is by far the strongest tribe, so it's going to be a while before they have to vote someone off. But when they do put pen to parchment, I think that Sydney will be too arrogant and too egotistical, especially if they avoid tribal for three or four rounds. 
if they're just sitting on a beach with her for that long, they're gonna get really annoyed by her. And my prediction for the top six is that it's gonna consist of Brad Reese, Sarah Wilson, Xander Hastings, Tiffany Seeley, a teacher, Heather Aldrit, a stay-at-home mom, and Ricard Foyer, a flight attendant. I think that before discussing how the endgame proceeds, I should briefly describe what I think is going to happen through the game to get us to this final six. As I mentioned, I think that Luvu is going to dominate the tribal portion of the game, at worst losing an immunity challenge and voting out Sydney. This, however, makes them seem extremely threatening overall, with Ua and Yase teaming up after the merge to take out the Luvu tribe members that remain. Once that group has been decimated, only a few are left, Ua and Yase are going to try and use the remaining Luvu members to take each other out. I think that Ua is actually going to have the advantage here. Appearing to be the weakest tribe early on is going to help reduce their threat level, and they seem to have the more overall likable group. When we get into the final six, I think we're going to see the remaining members of the Ua tribe, Brad, Sarah, and Ricard, believe that they're working with Heather, the last Luvu member standing. Brad would probably win this immunity challenge, and I think it would likely be for the first time because there are a ton of physical players this season. The plan here would be for the Ua tribe plus Heather to split the vote between Tiffany and Xander in case one of the two has a hidden immunity idol. That way, the two votes from Yase can't decide who goes home. After the tie, everyone would then vote against Xander, the bigger physical threat, or Tiffany if Xander plays an idol for himself. However, by this point, I think Ricard would likely emerge as the leader of the Ua tribe, a dominant force in challenges, a good strategic player, and someone who's pretty likable. When it gets down in numbers, it's going to be really hard for someone who seems so good on paper to hide. Realizing this, I think that Heather would vote with Tiffany and Xander to get rid of Ricard. With the Ua tribe splitting their votes, it would be pretty easy for Heather to just join up with Tiffany and Xander and vote Ricard out in a 3-2-1 to split. After Ricard's elimination, the physical threats would continue to go home, with Xander getting voted out 3-2 after Brad beats him in the next immunity challenge. At the final four, Brad, Heather, Tiffany, and Sarah are the last players remaining. I think Brad would be the favorite to win a final immunity challenge in this group, and seeing as they started on a tribe together, he'd probably take Sarah with him to the final three. This would leave Tiffany and Heather to make fire in a matchup that could surely only be rivaled by Becky and Sundra in Survivor Cook Islands. Right now, I think that Heather is being set up to lose the fire-making challenge, at least based on the content we've gotten preseason. In her Meet the Cast video, she confidently stated that she can make fire, which is giving me vibes similar to other players who have gone into this fire-making challenge overconfidently, like Devin in Survivor Heroes vs. Healers vs. Hustlers. And in addition to that, Tiffany has an advantage on her side in the form of the first look at the season, giving us the first few minutes of the show in which we see footage of her life back home. This season, the editors are taking a page from Australia's playbook, giving us an inside look at the players' lives, and typically the players who make it deep are introduced in the first episode. I was an alternate. I went from possibly being casted, so you're not on the cast, to being called 24 hours before you're going. I'm freaking out. So my prediction is going to be that the final three is Brad, Sarah, and Tiffany. In this group, I'd guess that Sarah would be praised for her social game, but I predict that she would play a very passive game, which the jury probably wouldn't want to reward. And Tiffany would be praised for being the last player from the Yase tribe, making it to the end as an older woman. But in her Meet the Cast video, she comes off as a bit abrasive, kind of similar to Reem from Edge of Extinction, and I don't see someone like her winning. Finally, Brad is someone who doesn't seem like he would have any enemies in the end. He played an impressive physical game, led his tribe, and as a fan of the show, he'd probably have the ability to make a few moves of his own. So, in the end, I don't think it would be a clean sweep, but I think Brad would be the likely winner in the end. Could my bias be influencing this? Definitely. But I do see him winning as an extremely likely outcome. And there are my predictions for Survivor 41. I am so excited for this season, and I hope to break down each episode as it airs. So if you would like to see me make more Survivor content, please leave a like and subscribe to the channel. 
I'll see you all next time, and I hope to be talking with you all about the premiere later this week.